And so let's begin by placing ourselves in the presence of God, reminding ourselves that the Lord is with us here as we are gathered in his name this evening. And as we begin in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this great opportunity once again to gather together as your people. Bless our time together, inspire us, penetrate our hearts with your word. Allow that consolation of your presence to enter us as we glorify you for that presence by saying glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So it's good to be here with all of you. I have had, I'm going, I know I'm going to have a very interesting week this week because it's already started to be very interesting since last night because two of my friends who were with me in the seminary arrived yesterday from uh, their priests on the East Coast. And they have come to visit fabulous Las Vegas. <laughs> and it's their first time visiting here. And they're staying at the Paris on the Strip. So pray for me because I'll have to visit them as I did last evening and they were all excited they said oh no they said to me they said oh it's just so wonderful you know we're here nobody knows us and so <laughs> and so they they got a couple uh, iced teas Long Island iced teas <laughs> <laughs> and they're sitting at, I think it was like a, one of those penny machines. I think it was a, a Flintstones machine where the Flintstones come out with their cart and all that. And they're all happy uh, having their iced tea. And they say, isn't this great? You know, nobody knows us. <laughs> And at that, I, I got up and I was walking around and somebody recognized me from, uh, from Christ the King. But it was further away, okay? They didn't see that this, uh, this lady recognized me and she recognized me from Christ the King because I said uh, Mass at Christ the King. And we started up a conversation and she says, well, what are you doing here? And I said, well, uh, I have a couple of friends who are priests and they're visiting from the East Coast. And she says, oh, and I said, yeah, look, you see those two over there, you know, <laughs> at the Flintstone machine. And I said, can you do me a big favor? <laughs> <laughs> Can you do me a big favor? Go up to them and say, Hello, Father! <laughs> and here you thought I was a good person. <laughs> Well, she went up and she says, hello, Father. <laughs> well, I mean, if anybody's looks could... <laughs> I, they got so red. <laughs> and later on, uh, later on when I told them they wanted to kill me. <laughs> But anyway, as the Bible says, whatever is hidden in the darkness will come to light. <laughs> so, you know, we may think we're anonymous and we may think nobody knows, but the important thing is that God knows. And with God, we have to be real and transparent. And this is where the first reading that we will read tonight tells us about the great love of the Lord for each and every one of us and the great invitation that he makes for all of us into this great life that he has in store for us. And so this is from the prophet Jeremiah. The word of the Lord came to me saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I dedicated you. A prophet to the nations, I appointed you. 
but do you gird your loins? Stand up and tell them all that I command you. Be not crushed on their account, as though I would leave you crushed before them. For it is I this day who have made you a fortified city, a pillar of iron, a wall of brass against the whole land, against Judah's kings and princes, against its priests and people. They will fight against you, but not prevail over you. For I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. The word of the Lord. If there's any doubt in any of us where we come from, this reading explains it. Even before we were formed in our mother's womb, God knew us. We come from God and we are on our way to God. All of us. And this is so very great because sometimes one of the things that hurts us the most or the prevalent disease among us is this sense of being unwanted, uncherished, that nobody loves me, nobody cares for me. And here the Lord God declares to each and every one of us, as he declared to Jeremiah, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. I dedicated you and I appointed you. And this is so beautiful for those of us who so many times feel an emptiness in our life. That all of us are loved and cherished as we are. And only when I internalize that unconditional acceptance of God in my life, that God accepts me as I am, not as others may want me to be or as I may want me to be, but that God accepts me the way I am, then in turn I can go out and, and accept the people in my life as they are and not as I may want them to be. And I want us to look at the gospel for this coming weekend as well. And this is Jesus coming into his hometown, into Nazareth. You know, Jesus was from Nazareth, and this is Luke's gospel. And here he is speaking to the people in the synagogue saying, Today this scripture passage is fulfilled in your hearing. And all spoke highly of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his mouth. They also asked, Isn't this the son of Joseph? He said to them, Surely you will quote me this proverb, Physician, cure yourself and say, Do here in your native place the things that we heard were done in Capernaum. And he said, Amen, I say to you, no prophet is accepted in his native place. Indeed, I tell you, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah when the sky was closed for three and a half years and a severe famine spread over the entire land. It was to none of these that Elijah was sent, but only to a widow in Zarephath in the land of Sidon. Again, there were many lepers in Israel during the time of Elisha, the prophet, yet not one of them was cleansed, but only Naaman, the Syrian. When the people in the synagogue heard this, they were all filled with fury. They rose up, drove him out of the town, and led him to the brow of the hill on which their own on which their town had been built to hurl him down headlong. But Jesus passed through the midst of them and went away. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. And thank you, Lord, for this Gospel. Family honor. We hear a lot about family honor because the Middle East is on our minds and in the news a lot. And family honor for the people of the Middle East is very important. You know that. For example, you have heard of people in the Middle East, for example, mothers and fathers uh, killing their own daughters who dishonor the family by marrying someone that they 
do not wish their daughter to be with or somebody that they do not approve of. And not only daughters are murdered, but also sons are murdered if they dishonor the family in any way. So honor is extremely important. This is the society and the culture in which Jesus comes from. The society and the culture he was part of. And in the Mediterranean world, everyone had a proper place that was established by their birth. No one was ever expected to become something better than or to improve on the lot of their parents. This fact is the basic foundation of honor, the public claim to worth, and the public acknowledgement of that worth by others. Each child inherits, carries on, and is expected to safeguard the family's honor. You know, for example, that in India they have the caste system. You don't move out of the caste system. You don't intermarry outside of your caste system. You see why it's so very important for us when we look at others, for example, when we look at uh, this particular honor system in the Middle East, a lot of us say, oh, how terrible. They're it's bad because we're judging the people there through the, our own criteria, through our own cultural norms and the way we would want them to be. You can't do that. We have to try to understand the people of the Middle East as we have to try to understand all the people we share our life with, where they're coming from, not where you're coming from, where they're coming from. That's how they grew up. It's part of their culture. That's why they do it. Rather than saying, oh, it's wrong or it's bad, try to understand it. That's where problem comes, problems come in when we try to impose rather than understand. Jesus is perceived by others in his village to be stepping shamefully beyond his family boundaries. Only when you understand that can you understand the people there. That's why a lot of times when we read this, we say, oh, how terrible those people were. Well, Jesus is doing something countercultural. Jesus went against the norm of his day. And he's asking us to do the same. That's why we as Christians have to be different. If you think about it, in the early church, the Bible tells us people were joining in massive numbers. And when they were joining the Christian community, they were joining and entering almost their sure death. Because when you joined the Christian community, it was more than likely that you were going to be end up dead. And not just dead in a normal fashion. If you got beheaded, you were lucky. Really, that's why Paul... The Apostle Paul, he was beheaded because he was a Roman citizen. But if you were not a Roman citizen, you, got on, you were crucified, put on lampstones, fed to the lions, all sorts of things. And that's what people were joining. And why were they, join, why were they joining? The Bible says because they looked at the Christians and they were countercultural. There was something different about them. They looked at them and they said, look how they love one another. Look how they love one another. Look how they love. Can the world say the same thing about us? We are called to be different in the world. And to bring a different message as Jesus was different. See, he's challenging the people of his day. Does the gospel come today to challenge us? Does my church challenge me? Does my faith challenge me? Or... Am I just going through the motion? See, it's easy to be religious. Very easy to be religious. It's not about being religious. In other words, uh, coming to church every week. Because it's my obligation to go to church every week. If you just come out of obligation, your faith is very shallow. You've got to challenge yourself to grow. We are to come because God loves me. I love God and I want to be different. I want to change. That's why I, when people say, well, you know, uh, 
you go a little bit overboard there. You know, like uh, this past uh, Saturday, I had the 4.30 Mass, and before the 4.30 Mass, okay, this uh, uh, gentleman before Mass, he came, he, he comes to me and says, Father, you know, um, I come to the 4.30 Mass usually, but usually, you know, I try to make the uh, 6 o'clock happy hour, you know. Uh, <laughs> Can you, can you get us out by 5.30, you know, so that uh, we can make the happy hour? And I said, well, isn't this happy hour enough? You know? <laughs> Here you're coming in, Mass hasn't even started, and what you're thinking about is the happy hour. That's why Fathers 45 are so popular, the ones who do Mass in 45 minutes, you know, very popular. Because we want it out. There's a lot of hole-punching Christians, you know, let's just punch our card. Come on in, you know, I got to do this. No challenge, no change. It's, the, the, it's not challenging me. It's just, I go through the motions. Are we just going through the motions? If we're just going through the motions, then there's going to be no change in us. And change is something that has to happen constantly in us. All the time. That's why I get every, every one of us, we are called to get up in the morning and say, Lord, today's going to be better. What is it that I need to rid myself of today? What is it that is not allowing me to follow you more fully? In my life. What am I going to work on? Jesus was different. And he's calling us as his followers to be different. And Jesus is stirring controversy in this village here where he's from. Because he's not carrying on Joseph's trade. He's doing something different. Jesus is different. He is accepting of all people. As they are, loving of all people, ministering to all people. He's rubbing salt into the wound opened by his insulting behavior, preaching in his hometown, but healing elsewhere. He wasn't supposed to do that. Because you're supposed to only minister to your own kind. Your own, most of the people in Nazareth were, were probably related to him. And he, he went out and healed elsewhere. It rubbed them the wrong way. Because he's going beyond himself. What do we do so many times? We like to have be enclosed, create our own safe places and stay there. We don't like to go out of our comfort zones. And that's what we are called to do. Love everybody as he did. Jesus inserts himself into the prophetic line of Elijah and Elisha. Like them, he ministers not to fellow Mediterranean Judeans, but rather to Gentiles, non-Judeans, the people who are thought to be unclean, unworthy, people not of his own kind, to direct his healing activities to such rather than to those of his own hometown. And he's transgressing very seriously against family honor, and yet he is willing to do it. And he's teaching us to go beyond ourselves as well, to reach out beyond our own comfort zone, outside of the places and the people that we are comfortable with. One of the, on one of the many retreats that I was at uh, in the seminary, and in fact the two who are visiting now were at that same retreat, and that's how I remembered uh, as they, I was getting ready to welcome them to beautiful and fabulous Las Vegas. And I did tell them, I said, you know, you all have some 30 inches of snow back east while I get to live in paradise. <laughs> But as, as I was reminiscing about our time in the seminary, I thought of this one retreat that we went on. And uh, while you're in the seminary, you go on many retreats. Those are like times to get away. And where you have time of prayer and reflection. I recommend retreats to all of you if you have an opportunity to go on one. And one of the exercises, because you go through different exercises on, uh, on the retreat, it was to think about those times in our lives when somebody was Christ to us. Because we talked about this before, how we are called to be Christ to one another. 
We are called to recognize Christ in each other and be Christ to one another. And so this is what the retreat master, so the priest who was in charge of the retreat, he said to us, you know, think of those times when somebody was Christ to you. And so one by one, we were all getting up and we were speaking about those times when somebody stuck with us when we were sick. Oh, they were Christ to us because they stuck with us because we were sick. Or when they comforted us when we were in trouble or listened to us when we needed to be listened to. And so, except one seminarian who's now a priest, he's not one of the ones visiting, but... He got up and he said something that has stuck with me to this very day. He said, when I think of those times when someone was Christ to me, I think of the time when someone spoke the truth so clearly to me that I wanted to kill him for it. When somebody told me the truth that I wanted to kill him for it, they were Christ to me. This is what is happening to Jesus in the gospel today. He speaks truth and the people want to kill him for it. I felt many times like that in my previous parish. You know, it was all nice when I was saying wonderful things. You know, God loves us, you know, hope. But when I started challenging people, you have to go to confession. You have to love everybody, not just the people of your own kind. When I started calling out things, challenging the way the church was being run, the dynamics inside of the church, you know, they were trying to create this club. I said, no, 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 everybody is welcome here. All people are welcome here. Oh, they really didn't like that. Interrupt people the wrong way because we don't like to be told we're doing something wrong. We don't like to be challenged. None of us do. And yet we are called to do that in great charity, with great love. We're called to do that. And this is exactly what Jesus is doing with the people in the gospel today, which is why they want to kill him. You've had that same experience in your own life. So the seminarian on this particular retreat burst our bubble because he pointed out something we would all rather forget, namely, that the Christ among us is not only the one who comforts us and rescues us, but the one who challenges us and upsets us. The people who challenge us and upset us are also Christ to us. In other words, we, as followers of Jesus, are called to love all people, even the uncomfortable people around us. If I am a Democrat and I only love Democrats, I'm not being Christ-like. I am called to love Republicans as well. If I am Catholic and I only love Catholics because they're part of my small little circle, then I'm not being Christ-like. I'm called to love all people, no matter their religion, all people. If I am in the United States and I'm looking at all those people who are trying to kill me and inflict pain on me and cause extreme violence, I'm thinking here of the people of ISIS and I say I hate them. I'm not being Christ-like because I'm called to recognize Christ in all people, including my enemies. That's what Jesus said, didn't he? That's countercultural. It says something different. Love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Turn the other cheek. Oh, that's different, isn't it? That's not what we are told to do. We're told to love those who love us. And Jesus says something different. If you love those who love you, what makes you different? Even the pagans do that, he said. They do that. You are to love those who may be uncomfortable to love. Those who challenge you. That's what's different about us. That's what got Jesus on the cross. Because he loved all people including those who hated him. He preferred, in other words, the company of misfit people who were uncomfortable to religious people. 
Oh, he did. He preferred the company to mi of, of misfit people. Look at the people he chose to hang around with. The apostles. To religious people. It was the religious people who conjured up the plot to kill him. Because they didn't want to be challenged. And so many times in our life, it's the same thing. I can tell you so many times when it was religious people who have hurt me. And maybe it's been religious people in your life who have hurt you. How many people have stopped going to church because of something a priest did to them? Or somebody religious did to them? You know that. It's absolutely horrible. And yet we are called to love everybody, including the people who hurt us, who inflict pain on us. That's hard. But that's the challenge of the gospel. Christ is among us in all the people we meet, in all of them. Christ is present in the uncomfortable people, the inconvenient people. In today's day in society, the unborn baby. Christ is there. We are called to recognize Christ there. God there, in other words. The prisoner. I can't tell you, this is another aspect of being in Crescent City. I was the pastor of a parish in the entire county. It was the entire county, Del Norte County, in Northern California. I was the only priest there. And uh, part of the town, we had almost 3,000 inmates in the maximum security state prison called Pelican Bay. And I was the chaplain there at uh, Pelican Bay State Prison. But I was also the pastor of the parish where I was at. And the people who, the many, many of the people who came to the church were the corrections officers or the prison guards, as they are uh, commonly called. And they did not like it. In fact, you could say they hated the fact that I went to the prison and ministered to the prisoners and then ministered to their families. They didn't like it. It rubbed them the wrong way. Father, they do not deserve your time. They don't deserve this. Don't you know what they did? And yet, let's punch our card on Sunday for Mass. You know, we're going to be there. We're religious. That was one of the hard aspects of dealing with that. And it, it was... Because you have to challenge all people to love everybody. We don't... It, think about that. How do, you, how, how do you love somebody who has murdered multiple and multiple, multiple people and raped and raped and raped multiple people and cut people up? And yet that's what Jesus is calling us to. Because that person's humanity is just as valuable as yours. Their human dignity is no less than yours. That's hard. Hard to get that into us. I was watching uh, Forensic Files once. It's a program on TV where they describe all sorts of crimes. And... Uh, I still watch forensic files. In fact, I watch a lot of it. And Father Mark says that, uh, he says to me, are you plotting my murder? Is that why you're... Anyway, I was watching Forensic Files, and this, they had this, the, the show was on this mass murderer who had murdered multiple, multiple people. And he was sentenced, uh, he, they were having now the sentencing phase of the trial. And the victims of the multiple people that he had murdered were, were getting up one by one and testifying at the trial. And they were all standing up and one by one they were getting up and they were saying, I wish I could 
Insert the needle as you will be executed. I wish I could pull the switch of the electric chair. I hate you because you have murdered my mother. I hate you. One by one. Lots and lots of them were getting up and saying this. And then this one lady got up. And she looked at him and she was sobbing. She was crying and she says, you know... And meanwhile, let me tell you, while all those people were getting up and telling him how much they hate him, he was sitting there smiling, smirking. It, he had no expression of no change on his face, this mass murderer, serial killer. And this one lady got up and she says, you know, all these people just got up and they told you how much they hate you. But I, she says, I am a Christian. I do not hate you. I love you in the name of Jesus. And not only that, I forgive you. You took my mother. You cut her up. You raped her. You murdered her. You tortured her. But I do not hate you. I love you in the name of Jesus. And I forgive you. And you know what happened at that moment? The guy started crying. He began to cry. Hate does not move hearts. We are to love all people. We are to love so much that we love the hell out of them. Because let me tell you, let me tell you, she loved the hell out of that guy. Because at that moment, his heart was melted. Love entered his life. I don't know his life story. He probably has a horrible life story. I should Google him and look him up. I <laughs> venture to say his life story is he was probably abused, went through terrible things that moved him to do what he did. She loved the hell out of him. As we are called to do in our life and in our walk with all the people we meet, as uncomfortable as they may be, as annoying as they may be, and there's a lot of people who annoy us. Uh-huh, I know that very well. Okay? Who rob us the wrong way. And yet, we are called to love. In a very challenging way. Christ is present in the undocumented immigrant. The people who do not have papers, in the refugee from Syria, in the people who are trying to kill us, in our political leaders, as much as some of them cause our stomachs to churn. And I'm so happy to see all of you here because I, I thought there wasn't going to be people here, but it's full. And yet there is a debate going on. And I'm, I'm glad that you prefer being here than listening to all that bickering and... Oh. You know, I'm glad. Thank you for being here. But Christ is present in the people who bother us, who annoy us. Yes, as uncomfortable as that is to hear. In our family dynamics, we are called to recognize Christ in every person, particularly those we find it most difficult to love and accept. If you do not believe this, Maybe this is because you have not recognized Christ in some of the offensive people God has sent your way. Whoever has offended you. That's how it is in this life. People offend us all the time. They hurt us all the time. And yet we are called to love them. You know, the prevalent attitude in our midst today is the F word. When somebody hurts you, mm -hmm, when somebody hurts you, you, what the world tells you to do is shrug them off, shrug them off and tell them the F word, right? And move on. That's what the world tells you. We also use an F word as Christians. Do you know the F word we use? Forgiveness. That's our F word. I'm sure some of you are going to go home tonight and you're going to text your exes, all your exes, right? You know. <laughs> I was at Bible study tonight. <laughs> I won't go. <laughs> I forgive you. <laughs> That's the F word we use. 
It's not an automatic thing. We work toward it. Don't worry. Do not despair. People have hurt you in your life. Whatever you've gone through, maybe you've been raped. It's very prevalent. Maybe you've been hurt by your parents. Maybe you've been hurt by your ex. It happens a lot. Maybe you've been hurt by your children. Maybe you've been hurt by church leaders. Maybe whoever has hurt you, if, if you're on the way to forgiveness, that's what Jesus wants, that we're on the way. As long as we try. People tell me all the time, you know, Father, I don't know, I can't seem to forgive. Are you trying? If you're trying, then you're okay. As long as you try. That's what we are asked. See, the thing is, is in this light, we are not going to be victorious over our struggles. In other words, this whole life is, is a constant struggle. We constantly struggle. That's our life. And people think, oh, when is this going to be over? When am I going to stop having all of these issues and struggles in this life? You know when it's going to be over? When you die. That's when it's going to be over. Our victory, our victory as followers of Jesus is in the struggle. Our victory is not that I'm going to be victorious over my struggles, but my victory is in the fact that I do struggle. And as long as I struggle, as long as I get up every single day and I say, I'm going to be better, I'm going to work on it. In other words, I want to forgive the people who have hurt me. Maybe I'm not there yet, but I'm on the way. That's what counts, that I'm on the way. And God blesses that. God blesses you as long as you try. That's why don't let anybody ever tell you, you know, you're going to confession and you're confessing the same things. But you're trying. That's what counts. You're trying. And God sees. God knows your heart. He formed you in the womb before... He formed you in your mother's womb. He knows you. Even before you were formed in your mother's womb, He knew you. The Bible tells us today. And He blesses you in your struggle. God sends all the people that rub us the wrong way, our way in our world, in order so that we do not get confused about our ideas of God with God. And we have that, it's, it's, when we're religious, we can get confused about who God really is. You know, oh, is he out there? You know, it's a... Look around. That's where God is. Not out there. That's easy to do. To say, oh, God is out there somewhere. Because that, if, if your God is out there somewhere floating around, then he won't hurt you. He, he, he doesn't uh, cause you annoyances. Or irk you the wrong way. It's hard to say, oh, I love you, God, and the people who are around me because they hurt me, they do bad things to me, they annoy me, they're uncomfortable, and all that. That's hard to do. That's why the Bible says the people who say, you know, God is out there somewhere are liars. How can you say God is out there somewhere and say, I love you, God, and yet hate people? How can you say, I love God, whom you do not see, and yet hate people whom you do see, when God equates himself with human beings? That's Christianity, the incarnation, God becoming a human being. It's not that God left. God is among us, walking. It's easy to go to church and, you know, just to be focused, you know. There's my God right there. There's God right there. And when you come in, you don't even notice whoever's sitting next to you. I'm not saying get into a conversation in church, no. But if somebody says hello to you, say hello back. Won't hurt you. Okay? Say hi. They're having as many struggles as you do. They've got as many issues as you do. They're just as hurt as you are. They're in the same boat as you are. Okay? So it won't hurt you just to say hello. Hi. You know, acknowledge the person, be nice and be cordial. That's what we're called to do. It's 
easy to do, especially in a church where so many people look for a small group. It's easy for us to get confused in church about our idea of God, especially if we're looking for a group of like-minded people. And I put the like-minded in quotes because there really is no like-minded people. We're all as different as we can be. I spoke when, once with an a evangelical pastor. Uh, evangelical, uh, evangelicals are uh, very conservative uh, Christians who take the Bible uh, literally. And in the previous town I was at, we had a few evangelical churches and I tried to have a good relationship with everybody. Uh, some of them, I was more successful than with others because some play better with others than some play better with others than some other ones. And but anyway, this particular evangelical pastor, he came. I invited him to mass. I said, "Oh, come, you know, I'd love to have you. We want to get along with everyone. We're all Christians, you know." Uh, when the people of when ISIS kills Christians, they don't say, excuse me, are you Catholic or are you evangelical or uh, are you Methodist? Are you Lutheran? Are you Orthodox? No. If you're a follower of Christ, you're a target. So it's, 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 it's a great scandal how we do not get along with each other. And yet we say we're followers of Christ. And he came and he says, you know, this is so interesting, he says. I don't know. I'm so curious about this church that you have, he says. Because here you have people, and he knew the people from the town because he was, he was already pastor like 15 years of the church he was at. And so he knew a lot of the people who were there. And he says, it's so interesting. I've never seen this before. In the, in the Catholic church, you have people who are opposites of just about every political issue in the country and I know that they they would like to I, I don't know how it is that they're sitting here together you have people of ev every racial background sort of like here at St. Joseph it's absolutely so wonderful you know we have people including here tonight this evening people who are here from Mexico, from the Philippines, from other Latin American countries, people who are gay, who are straight, people who are Democrats and Republicans, people who are conservative, people who are liberal, all sorts of all sorts of divisions. And it's so wonderful. And then and, th and then you have a priest who's an immigrant to this country from an uh, who's leading the whole thing and that's I mean and we're in the great United States of America and we're in the U Catholic Church isn't that wonderful be proud be proud of who you are be proud where I mean I'm, I'm so proud of the church I am a part of. Wouldn't ask for any other church. When I look at all of you here, I kind of imagine it's sort of like heaven is like, what heaven is like. All of us coming together from all sorts of different backgrounds and races and persuasions. And we all come together. It's absolutely united by the love of Christ who loves us so much each and every one of us, as we are, and calls us to do the same thing with one another. I said one answer of how we can get along together, and the reason why he was so amazed is because at his church, everybody was right, white, right-wing, and Republican. And started like a mutual adoration club. You know, we all agree on one, we're, we're all the same. You know, and everybody, people who are different are not welcome, not embraced. I know Pope Francis says everybody is welcome. Everyone. So absolutely, absolutely. This is, 
This is what the church is about. It's not a museum for saints, but it's a hospital, as he says, for sinners, where people who are wounded by life come to find some solace and comfort and consolation on this walk, on this journey that we call life. See, all of us have a secret list of people we would rather not sit next to. They may be specific people you can name or certain kinds of people. They are there because we believe them to be sinners. And we like to point that out. There are some people who offend us because we believe them to have offended God. This is the great problem that I find. This is, this is the only time in the confessional when I get very upset. Other times I'm very calm. And, but the only time I get upset is when people come and they start telling me about the sins of all their other family members and friends. That really rubs me the wrong way. Father, I really don't have anything, but let me tell you about my husband. You know. <laughs> let me tell you about my sister-in-law. Excuse me, this is about you. What are your sins? Not somebody else's. But we like to do that. We like to focus on what's wrong with everybody else and not, not, not what's wrong with us. That's what Jesus said. Before you notice the big beam in somebody else's eye, notice the big beam that you have in your own eye. In other words, before you notice the splinter in somebody else's eye, notice the beam that you have in your own. It's maybe a lot bigger. Oh no, we don't like to do that. We love to judge as people. And this happened also, see, this is wonderful. Here I get to talk to all of you about my previous experiences in my other parishes. When I leave St. Joseph, husband of Mary, watch out! Okay? <laughs> but remember, this is Las Vegas. What happens in Vegas? <laughs> But this one time, this was also a, the Saturday evening mass. I don't know about that Saturday evening crowd. <laughs> this was a Saturday evening mass, and I was uh, in the sacristy getting ready for mass, and this gentleman uh, came into the church, and he was wearing a hat. And the regular group of ladies, older ladies, who kind of were running the whole, you know, they were they very religious folks, and they were very into you know, militant, you know. <laughs> and they, one by one, they were trying to go and convince the guy to take his hat off. And he was trying to tell him no, you know. He didn't want to take his hat off. And finally, you know, after maybe about the third or fourth lady went up to him to try to get him to take his hat off, he left the church. And I met him on the way out. And I said to him, oh, hi, are you visiting? Because I knew everybody. It was a small church, and I knew who was visiting and who was not. And he says, yes, I'm visiting, and I despise this church. And I said, why? And he says, well, I came in here, and they're trying to get me to take my hat off. And then he took his hat off for me. And he had this big hole here because he had part of his skull removed uh, for a surgery that he had. And he hadn't had it replaced yet. And he says, I'm really embarrassed. I don't want to take my hat off. And they're trying to make me one by one take my hat off. Now, I said, okay. I'll take care of it. And so I went, and instead of getting into an explanation with the ladies, I just said, listen, ladies, mind your own business. <laughs> <laughs> Are you here to pray or to guard others in their prayer? Well, this is an experience that happens so often because we like to, when we look at other people, we like to pass judgment. Oh, this person this, this person that. You don't know what they're going through. You don't know their story. This is what gets me because I have the great privilege as a priest to get to know people's stories. And that's what has given me, I think, immense compassion for people in their walk. All people. You don't know, it's absolutely unbelievable the pain and the sorrow that people experience in their lives.
I could just go through today and tell you what, you know, all that I encountered today, and I'm not going to for various reasons, but uh, people's lives are very painful. As your life is painful, the people who are around you, their lives are not easy either. All the people you meet don't have an easy life. Don't add to it by your attitude. You are to lift people's burdens. Lift them. Lift their burdens and lift them up. Not add to it through your attitude or through the judgment or through the way that you carry yourself. And the people around us are not our enemies. They are our brothers and sisters. All people around us are our brothers and sisters. All of them. And what is happening in our country today, where the political rhetoric is so demeaning, is that one side is out to get the other. Is it now you can't even watch TV? I mean, everybody's tearing each other apart. And then that gets into us, where we try to tear one another apart. These people are undocumented. They're here legally. These people are you know, Democrats. They're Republicans. These are conservatives. These are liberals. All this division all around. Don't get suckered into that mentality. Don't get into that. People who are around you are your neighbors. Not the people who look like you or think like you or are like you, but all people around you are your neighbors. All people. And this attitude of people being my enemies is like that because we do not like to see the people who are not like us and think of them as God's friends. And all people are God's friends. Even those who are different than us. That's why I loved it when Vice President Biden, our current Vice President, responded angrily when he announced that he would not run for President. I watched that. It was a powerful statement. And he responded angrily to the statement by Hillary Clinton that Republicans are her enemies when she said, Republicans are my enemies. And he responded so angrily to that. He, uh, President Biden, he goes to church every day, by the way. He's a daily churchgoer. He's Catholic. And he says, no, Republicans are not my enemies. They may be my political opponents, but they are not my enemies. And this was very powerful. And this is not just for politics, but all people who may not think like us or agree with us. They're not our enemies. They are our neighbors. And we don't like to hear that God loves the people we wouldn't want to sit next to. And why... And that is why we would like a church of like-minded people. This is why some of the growing and more popular churches today are the so-called evangelical churches where people think alike and look alike. And they all get together and have messages preached to them that appeal to them. You won't get that in the Catholic Church, I'm sorry. You we're all different, all of us. And you know why? Because we are all part of what I like to call the island of misfit toys. <laughs> and I didn't come up on that on my, uh, on my own. There was a movie called The Island of Misfit Toys. We're all misfits in one way or another. Not one of us is perfect. That's why we are called sinners. When Pope Francis was asked, describe in one sentence who you are. This is the Pope now, who we all recognize as a walking saint. Right? We, that's why we call him the Holy Father, our Holy Father. And if there's anyone who deserves that title, it's him. And Pope Francis, when he was asked, describe to us in one sentence, who is Jorge Mario Bergoglio? That's his name before he was Francis. And he says, I am a sinner. I am a sinner. In other words, I am imperfect. I am a misfit toy. And all of us are that way. The people who rob us the wrong, rob us the wrong way, who disturb us, belong to God just as much as we do. Because we rob, disturb, and annoy them and others just as much as they do. 
In other words, we're all sinners who need a Savior to save us from ourselves and our misguided notion of our own superiority and grandiosity. Our problem is that the people we cannot stand are loved just as much as we are. In order for our life together to work, we do not have to see eye to eye with each other on everything. We do not even have to like each other, but we do have to respect each other's dignity as human beings, which is what we have in common. Our common life together is deteriorating all around us, particularly now with this new political rhetoric that is going on, largely because we have begun to regard strangers as enemies. In a world that grows scarier every day, many of us have retreated to a well-defended private life, and we guard it. The endless variety of mankind becomes a threat and not a blessing. And all of you are a great blessing in your difference to me. And we are called to show that in one another. I don't want any of you to be like me. And you shouldn't... We, we're all different, all of us. We all come from a... a, a we're, we're all different. I want you to be like Jesus. That's what I want you to be like. He's the one perfect person. And I hope that well, you know, during my time here that I do not lead you to me, but I lead you to Jesus Christ, who is our Savior, the one who gave his life for us, and who loved us to this great extreme, and who loves us to this, and who will always love us, to the great extreme of the cross, where he gave his life for us, that we might have life and enjoy life and celebrate life. Jesus preferred the company of misfit people to religious people. That's why we're all in good company. Because he prefers our company. He's in our midst. Where two or three are gathered, there I am in their midst. I want to end this evening by telling you to focus on what happened when Jesus preached in his own town. He preached to the people there, his own, his own people. And after he finished preaching to them, what did they do? They tried to kill him. So what does the Bible say? What did he do after they tried to kill him? He passed them by. Now there was a great crowd there. And Jesus passed through there and went on his way. How did he do this? Ask yourself this question. How did he do this when there were all these people there? How, how, how did he pass by? I don't know. But he will pass us over as well. Unless... We get it, unless we try to get it. And I got it once in my life. I got a big wake-up call. It's what we call an aha moment. And the aha moment is a philosophical term, but the, the Christian term or theological term for an aha moment is a moment of grace. And I hope that the, tonight has been a moment of grace for many of us who are here tonight, that you have experienced some moments of grace. These aha moments are wake-up calls. And all of you know, because I've told you before, that I lived in Mexico in the state of Oaxaca, a very impoverished state of Oaxaca, for quite some time. And while there, there, there is a tunnel there that leads to a bus station in, in the town. There's a tunnel. And there's all these beggars in the tunnel. And I was determined while I was walking through that tunnel, to just pass by everyone, walk like this, as we do so many times, you know, we're, we just walk like this. And I was determined to do exactly that, walk like that through that tunnel without noticing the people who were there. But again, moment of grace, why did this happen? I don't know. But this one young lady, about 25 years old, she caught my attention. She had a... a 
sign hanging down from her neck and the sign said I am infected with the HIV virus please help me in Spanish it was estoy infectada de sida por favor ayúdame please help me I, I don't know why but I was I stopped there in front of her and I was looking at at, uh, at the sign that was there and I said you know uh, I don't really have much to give you and I didn't have much to give her because I had already spent all the money at this flea market and so I didn't have <laughs> I didn't have much in Spanish the flea market is called La Pulga okay and Pulga is a, a flea okay and so I, I had already gone to La Pulga and spent all the uh, um all the money there and so I told her I said you know I don't have any money to give you but is there any way that I could help you and at that she stood up she stood up and she looked at me and she said hug me hug me and you know what I did at that moment when she said that this And after a few moments, I did hug her. But it wasn't the same as if I had done it with the enthusiasm and the attitude that should befall a follower of Jesus Christ who recognizes Christ in all people. All people. Even the inconvenient people the ones we may least want to see Christ in. In other words, I missed my opportunity to hug Jesus that day. And we can all miss ours. We can all miss our opportunity when Christ passes our, us over. If we continue in our hardened attitudes, superior 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 attitudes if we continue in those if we continue thinking we are better jesus will pass us over as he did there was there was the whole town was there how did he get away did you ask yourself that question how could he get away they wanted to kill him how did he get away he was one how? What the Bible is trying to say here is that just like those people didn't want to listen because their hearts were hardened, neither do we so many times. And when we do not listen, when our hearts are hardened, Jesus will pass us over and go away. Because God doesn't impose. God invites. You are invited. That's why he says, you are invited. Few are chosen. All are invited. Few are chosen. Isn't that what he said? Few are chosen. The ones who are chosen are the ones who respond to the invitation. I missed my opportunity that day in that tunnel. Don't miss yours. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We thank you for this grace-filled evening, Lord. For the many aha moments that you have presented to us. And we glorify your name. And we ask you to give us the strength to amend our lives, to change, and to become better. As we strive to serve you, we pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Amen. And may the Lord be with you. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
And please be seated for just one minute. I'm going to make a couple quick announcements. The first one is Father Mark has asked me to ask all of you to please consider becoming Eucharistic ministers, extraordinary ministers of communion, those who distribute communion at Mass. If you would be interested, there is a training this Saturday, which you can come to. Uh, and it, more information is in the bulletin of the church, which is available on our website. Or you could call the parish office for more information. The other announcement is that Lent is beginning on Wednesday, February 10th. And then after that, we're going to have our suppers here. And I think they're free. So there will be free food here. So consider doing that so that you can mingle and spend time with people. I highly encourage that. The third announcement is I have a book recommendation for all of you. I talked about a retreat, right? And I know a lot of you have busy lives and you can't go on a retreat. For those of you who would like to make a retreat and who cannot make a retreat, there is a book that will allow you to make a retreat. I'm very serious. It's based on the Ignatian uh, method, which, which is a 30-day retreat. How many of us can give up 30 days and go on a retreat? I haven't even done that, okay? So, and the book is called Consoling the Heart of Jesus. Consoling the Heart of Jesus. It is by Father Michael Gately. Father Michael Gately, and I will have this information for you in next week's notes, but I thought of it this evening, and I didn't want to pass this opportunity to tell you so that you can get it. It is available on Amazon, okay? And, or I think it's also available on your Kindle or your iPad or wherever you get your iBooks, and it is again called Consoling the Heart of Jesus. Phenomenal, life-changing, and I mean that with my whole heart. Absolutely. This author, Father Michael Gately, is unbelievable. He is phenomenal. His last name is spelled G-A-I-T-L-E-Y. Father Michael Gately. G-A-I-T-L-E-Y. I highly recommend it. Uh, I know some of you were saying, I'm looking for something for Lent. People were saying, recommend me something for Lent. Well, nothing better than consoling the heart of Jesus. And you will be renewed by this retreat that you will make. And the other announcement is, please come back next Monday. And please tell people to come. People were asking me, can I bring somebody if they're not Catholic? Of course. Everybody is welcome. Okay? Everybody is welcome. So, bring other people. And if you haven't signed in, please sign in. I haven't had a chance last week to send any emails because I was just simply uh, too busy. And I probably 